Welcome to PartialArc.com. <laughs> Don't do that. Do you want to hear a story? I'm not letting go. Are you ready for this? Follow your heart. I'm going in. This. This is. This is. Blockbuster Punch-Up. Welcome to Blockbuster Punch-Up. This is episode 15. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and I'm joined by my co-host and film enthusiast, Todd G. Levin. Hi. I like how you... <laughs> Todd G. Levin. G. Levin. Yeah. Um, 15. Yeah. That's surprising. 15, Should yeah. we have a party? I think we should. A 15th I mean, birthday? Yeah. 15, I didn't well, I bought all these hats and balloons for specifically this reason. I didn't realize it had been this long. I was wondering about those boxes of the hats and the balloons. You were, right? I don't know. They were actually extra, extra large hats. I, uh, <laughs> I, I throw mainly for elephants. I do a lot of uh, animal birthday parties. Lots of prehistoric birthdays. A lot of prehistoric birthdays. Here. Um, mostly for like land before time theme parties because that's such a huge popular movie now <laughs> among the dinosaur yeah, population di- of Los yeah. Angeles. They love that film. It's like the number one. Um, you know, it's like the number one it's dinosaur watch film. Yeah, number two is probably We're Back. Yeah, you know, we Just... love Gone with the Wind and stuff. Oh, We're Back. <laughs> You know what's amazing is like this is the second time I've talked about We're Back on a podcast this month. Really? Yeah. You talked about We're on which other one? Um, because comics. Really? Yeah. That's so. What is? Is it's there something a, going on? Have you seen? Is that? We're Back back? Have you, <laughs> we're we're bring, back. <laughs> we're bringing We're Back back. Nothing that we're doing has anything to do with dinosaurs. Nothing. Anything. But it does have to do with with robots. Guys, we're here to talk about Big Hero Six. Now you might be thinking right away, Big Hero Six. That movie didn't that win an Oscar? How could we possibly address an Oscar? I think this is the first time we've ever addressed a film that has won an Oscar. I have to think. Of, well, absolutely. I mean, Teenage Mutant Ninja. Yeah. So as we do, we kick off each of our episodes with a recap. Todd, please kick us off with the Big Hero Six recap. You got it. We open on a 14-year-old robotics whiz kid who makes wads of cash competing in illegal backroom battle bots tournaments. Oh, yeah. Bill Nye the Science Guy is there. <laughs> he sharks the competition with his superior technology. All of this to the chagrin of his older brother, Tadashi, an equally gifted but responsible student attending the San Francisco-Tokyo hybrid San Francisco equivalent of an MIT. Which they just dub nerd school. <laughs> nerd. <laughs> There's not even a name for it. No, just they're nerd. just like, Ah, uh, you know, welcome to nerd school. This is nerd. They say it like 50 times yeah, for is, some it's reason a, it's in the a film. Thing. Tadashi takes Hiro on a tour of the university, attempting to funnel his talents into a more productive avenue. Inspired by his visit, Hiro astounds a university uh, convention with his microbots, tiny electromagnetic components that can form into any shape and move at the will of the controller. And, and crushes the economy of the entire U.S. <laughs> <laughs> I remember watching that scene and being like, this invention would destroy <laughs> almost all of the jobs. Because like, it, it just, could be a car, it could be a like, this, it, it, it could be It would that. destroy all of transportation, it would destroy all of construction buildings, and construction, they're like, yeah. you can just build something in a second, and like you can just travel wherever you want. That's funny, Hero um, It would destroy all, health, all, health, all healthcare, because like you don't need a wheelchair anymore, you don't need because you can just think, and it'll just take you wherever you want. It's just like, it destroys all of the economy of the US. That's pretty Which villain. is really my punch-up, is that Hero right. is the villain. <laughs> <laughs> He's immediately accepted into the program, but while celebrating outside, an accident happens at the convention. Tadashi runs inside to save Callahan, killing die. him. So sad. Hiro is devastated. After a period of mourning, Hiro accidentally activates Baymax, and they follow one of his microbots to a warehouse full of them and are chased away by a masked man who's stolen Hero's invention. Hero devises a plan to use Baymax, equipped with armor and karate moves to return and fight the masked man. He matrix him, basically. That's He's right. Like, you, I know kung fu. <laughs> with, the, uh, with the help of uh, Tadashi's colleagues, they escape, and Hiro devises another plan to use the colleagues to make weapons with which to defeat the masked man together as a team of superheroes. The masked man is revealed to be Callahan himself. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> saved in the explosion by Hiro's microbots, and now uh, appropriating them to seek revenge on Cray, uh, Callahan's nemesis and CEO of the electronics company that took his daughter with the teleportation experiments. The evil Stargate operation, which is what it was. <laughs> right. I remember seeing that scene in the movie. I was like, is this Stargate? 100% Stargate. I was like, that would have been awesome. You just see them like go through like what you see two rooms. Like they go by <laughs> one room where you see them going through a Stargate. And then the other room is that accident that just happens. Like, just yeah. James Spader is in there. <laughs> Richard Dean Anderson uh, from St- uh, Kurt SG1 Russell is, is going there. through. Yeah, Kurt Russell's there. There's some Egyptians and stuff. Just 
just hanging know, out. Just tons of people. That would have been great. The team saves Cray from Callahan, and Hero uses Baymax to enter a teleportation portal to save Callahan's daughter, but is forced to leave Baymax behind. Do, 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 do. I'm outstretching my arm. No one can see it. <laughs> I'm doing it. Yeah, but they could hear it. They because... could hear the outstretch. That's what. It, well, that's what it sounds like when I move my arm, which is why I don't do it very much. When you move your arm, um, Titanic music Titan- just <laughs> echoes out of my uh, my joints. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a very specific it's disease. disease. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. The doctors are just loving it because they have no idea what's going <laughs> on. Um, uh, I'm a little bit perturbed for obvious reasons. They're but, uh, they're dubbing it Celine Dion's Celine disease. Celine Dion's disease. It's a CDD. <laughs> What were we talking about? Uh, Big Hero 6. Right. Oh, that movie. Yeah, the movie that stole the Oscar from yeah. Lego. Oh, yeah. Callahan is arrested. The day is saved. Wee! And Hero rebuilds Baymax 2. Manufacture them for the world to have healthcare robots that could save lives in, uh, in every corner of the globe? No. <laughs> That's right. He doesn't do that at all. To um, keep him in secret and maybe fight crime? To continue fighting... Uh, the crime? The, the crime San Francisco crime that they prevented because of the one guy, yeah, with his team of superheroes that he doesn't need anymore. You might know my punch up. <laughs> you right might now. know a few of our punch ups. <laughs> Anyways, guys, Todd, that was a great recap, and that'll take us into our punch up. Punch up. Oh, man. <laughs> Rocket fist, Todd. I did not expect your fist to come Fire off. off like that. Yeah. And and I also, what I really didn't expect is the Celine Dion music I to know. play. While the fist was in the air heading towards me, you've got a nice speaker system on that thing. What's amazing is when it plays at the same time when I fire the fist, it slows down and the music gets louder <laughs> to this beautiful realization that you're about to get punched in the face with Celine Dion music playing in the background. Oh, uh, I can't think of anything worse. Guys, you can't see this, but Todd is wearing the... Just the big- Wearing a Celine Dion the t-shirt Celine fan. Dion t-shirt. I, this is all irony. Yeah, Todd just loves Celine Dion so much. You've got the hat, which is weird because I don't think she is into hats. Like, where did you even get that? Listen, you run the hat manufacturing company. She, yes, I do, and I'm president of the fan club. So well, I think you you've know, made a wise life choice. I'm with Dion. Points. Well, I'm with Dion too, Todd. <laughs> but I don't, you know, I don't get the same kind of joy that you do. I realize it's insensitive now. Yeah, I think it is. I feel like you maybe should have asked, hey. Do you have Dion's disease? I just found out about it now, and now I feel very uncomfortable. Well, you can you see know, you just figured it out redness, because you're not as cultured, Todd. You can see the redness in my face. I can. It matches the beautiful redness of that Celine Dion t-shirt. And I'm a little jealous, but obviously, I can't really wear something like that, Todd. Is it ironic if you wear it? I mean, I don't know. Is it really just me embracing the Dion's disease? Because I think, I think it think might you be. Should. I think you should. I think you, you know should what, embrace Todd? the Dion's. Probably the first person who's going to do this, but Todd... Can I buy some of your Celine Dion merchandise? Yes! Guys. <laughs> so as we start, we like to talk about the things we liked. And what were the things we liked about Big Hero 6? A lot of things. A lot of things. Big Hero 6 is a super fun, awesome movie. Don't think for one second that the fact that we're doing a punch-up on this movie that we like didn't like it. In fact, we both... Oddly enough, for this episode, really liked Big Hero 6. Oh, really enjoyed it. It just has some problems. But the things that we liked about it... Okay, number one favorite thing about this movie, San Francisco. Oh my god, what a great idea! The world is so cool. I mean... It's not, like, brand new. The whole, like, you know, hybrid of an Asian culture and an American culture. Mm -hmm. Blade Runner did it. But this one was, like, you know, this Miyazaki thing with those giant turbines in the air. Yeah. And, And I mean, for me, one of the things I really liked about the film was Baymax. Everybody loves. But, I mean, knowing the character as he was originally in the comics, and typically when you make a big departure like that, especially for a comic fan like myself, it's typically like, why would you do that? But... It was a really genius way to bring this robot into this film and tell the story they wanted to tell. Uh-huh. And one, he's adorable. It, they, the design on the on this character is so simple, mm-hmm. but so great. Oh yeah, and I'd never seen like a robot like that, like a fluffy marshmallowy robot. Right, you never seen he's an inflatable robot. He's the wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube man <laughs> outside of Carlos. In, in obese wacky wavy yeah, flailing tube man. Yeah, just one small robot form. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> who we can all, dispense medical equipment? We've all probably did it like after seeing the movie, but Todd and I just I think did it recently on the, in, the, in between a break. The Baymax fist bound. The, the, uh, 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 they, uh, they, whenever he does the fist pound and they explode, I mean, he did it like three times in the movie, and I was probably dying of laughter every time he I did it. I was in an airplane, and 
I could not stop laughing every single time <laughs> that it happened. It was just, it was so adorable and cute and what a great character flaw. Like, what a great little character flaw that he, like, tries to, like, do things and, like, yeah. learn, but he, Whenever like, he learns something new, it's always just slightly off. <laughs> he's a robot. So and, great. And the great scene where he loses his battery and it's like he's, co- Hero's bringing him home like he's drunk. Oh, my God. The central relationship in the film. Between Hero and Baymax. Is Hero and Baymax. There, it's a buddy kind of comedy sort of situation where there it's like a hero and his sidekick kind of deal mm-hmm. and that works so well yeah. uh in the film and that was one of the best things about it and the fact like we talked about that he's a healthcare robot very innovative idea very instead of just like my older brother was building like a death robot a robot like it's <laughs> great that he's just a healthcare robot which in and part of that story part of some of the dramatic scenes are when heroes trying to turn him into something he's not when heroes trying to turn him into this like death murder machine And, like, it goes horribly wrong, and there's, like, big repercussions because of it. Those are really powerful because he's like, this is not what I'm supposed to be. I'm just supposed to help people. I'm not supposed to have rockets and punch people and destroy stuff. Which is a great, like, turn on On the, on, like, the, the, the robot movie, you know, the AI kind of film where it's, like, he's instead of you know it's just like oh i'm supposed to be this like you don't it's the human who's who makes turning. the error that's true that it's a really great uh turn on it and i loved I, so I most really, times the really robots like go haywire and then the humans have to bring it back and that's teach right. it humanity while this way the robot's teaching the human humanity because he's dealing with loss which is really uh bold that they i mean there's a lot of loss in this movie there is and that was one of the themes of the film and that was really nice too it, it, you know now that caused some of my problems and maybe we can Go ahead and hop over to the dislike right. column. So in our likes, you know, we've got the the world and the Baymax and Hero relationship is fantastic. But now let's talk a little bit about the dislike. So, Todd, what was your first one? So piggybacking on what we just talked about, Baymax is a healthcare robot who's designed for a certain purpose. And the brother of his creator is trying to, because of the loss of his brother, is trying to create him into something that he's not. Baymax keeps saying, like, this is not, you know, this is, will this help me be a better healthcare professional? And he's right. like, yeah, sure. And we can all agree that being a good healthcare professional as this robot, as his prime directive, etc., is a good thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So when we're seeing him being made not into doing that, we're thinking, well, this isn't good, right? Yeah. And so you'd think that the inevitable conclusion of that is to realize like, oh, you know what? You should not I was do wrong. That. He was good being like he needed to just be himself. He just needed to be Baymax. He right? needed to be Baymax and like and maybe help the people his solution way. Solution would be solved via the Baymax way. So this is one of my main problems because, you know, the, there seems to be a loss of a message here. What they were trying to teach. What they were trying to teach in terms of, you know, it's like shitty kid dealing with problems poorly. <laughs> tries to do something that's like tries to uh make something into something it's not and succeeds yeah he invents a whole superhero team to blot out the sadness he's feeling about the loss of his brother and then that's the answer and also uses their inventions because remember they all had their separate inventions uses their inventions for the same purpose which is a revenge tale and then the end of the film is is not like, but we shouldn't have done that. We it's, should have been true to ourselves and what we wanted to do. And, and that'll to, solve and the problem. And true to these inventions. Instead, you know, they're <laughs> appropriated into a revenge tale, into helping a revenge tale because somebody is not dealing with grief very well. It's almost like a reverse of Iron Man. Instead of him, like, giving up weapons development, they turn a bunch of kids into weapons developers because at the end of the movie that one dude in definitely invented lightsabers like the guy yep. that can just chop stuff like yep. he's definitely rolling around with lightsabers the other guy is in a suit that just spits fire so that's the stuff that like i had problems with with the hero's arc with his arc so uh, the other thing that we didn't really like very much right. uh is the villain i felt the villain in this film was really weak and one point in particular... There's a really big reason for that. I, I rewatched this film again. Callahan is supposed to be... The reason they put Callahan as the main villain is because they were like... They, they've seen the Spider-Man movies. They were they like, wanted the we twist, want the right? personal... Well, not only the twist, but we want the personal connection to the hero, right? That's how old Spider-Man does all his villains. You know, Green Goblin is actually Harry's father. Right. Or, you know, this is actually your science teacher. This is actually your neighbor. Like, right. they, you know, the villain having a personal connection to the hero outside of being a hero is a, is a good system. It's a good rule. It works. The problem here is Callahan doesn't have, like, something in his head making him crazy. Right. It doesn't have anything else, like... 
he's just like openly throughout most of the film if we realize that Callahan has been this villain he's like trying to kill these kids yes. who who have done nothing to him exactly they, they didn't wrong him ever exactly like he in many 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 scenes is trying to kill he's trying to kill these kids kill these kids now if if he was going if Callahan was going after Cray and they were like oh look out getting you in know, the way you have yeah. to let you look, and they're getting in the way and it's just like collateral that makes sense, right? And even having, like, moments, like, you could give him, like, a voice disruptor, right? So he could still say things. Again, he doesn't say anything until the end of the mm-hmm. movie. But, like, in these scenes, if Callahan is the villain, if he tries to stop the kids and, like, almost hurts or kills them, there should be a moment where we see the villain, like, hesitate. Or we see him, like, have, like, some, like... Absolutely. Are you, like, almost, like, check to make sure they're okay and then maybe go back to doing something Absolutely. else. Yeah. So we have some moments where we're like, oh, like, something's going on here with the villain or, like, the, the villain's actually human. When really, like, he's like a robot, a silent robot, the whole, like, a kill bot for the whole film. But by the end, it's like, it's Callahan! And, like, in this scene... Which w- was not a surprise. Which was not a surprise because there was only two other adults in the film that we've seen their two other male adults in the film that we'd seen their face so it had to be one of them and we knew it wasn't going to be the one they kept saying it was going to be because movies so it had and to be it, callahan or the other person it could have been is his brother right which, which would i have actually been, thought would have been a lot stronger which would have been interesting now i don't know why but that's the whole point right but i mean even with that if you had like made him brainwashed or something like that yes exactly because again the scenes with this villain just straight up trying to really kill these kids, especially kids that go to Callahan's school, doesn't make sense at the end with the twist. And it doesn't make me feel like this is, like, a harsh thing. It doesn't make me like, oh, no, like, it's their teacher. They both feel really bad and awkward about knowing this about each other. It's me being, like, more horrified. Like, this guy's a monster. Even uh-huh. when they show the scene where it's, like, his daughter got sucked up into a Stargate. Isn't that, like, wouldn't that make you go crazy? It's, like, uh, that doesn't explain why he went on, like, murder rampages against the kids that he supposedly really likes at his school. And the most important part about this, which I feel like everyone, at least in, including the movie, just seems to completely bowl over, is it's incredibly odd. It's even more odd mm-hmm. that he's going after these kids, especially Hero. When the invention that Hero created is the thing that saved his life. Yeah. So his life is saved by this little kid's invention that he just saw 10 minutes ago. Also, the thing with his daughter, like his plan doesn't make a lot of sense. Nope. Like we see him like near the docks and like we see him like on the Alcatraz why Island. Why wouldn't he just do it? Why wouldn't like, he just go? Why wouldn't he just go Cray? straight to Cray and then just like mess him up and kill him or destroy his building with the microbots? Why exactly. did he need a Stargate? Just just destroy everything. Well, why did he need any, why did he need like the, the lead up? That, that was my, like, main thing where I was just like, this villain doesn't make any sense. The villain, too, also the villain's plight doesn't tie into our hero in any way. Right. The, the whole, like, we learn from a vi- from watching like video Like, one video, like, about, you should care about uh, Callahan and you should care about this about woman you've daughter. never met. If it was, uh, now, if it was, Cal- if it was uh, Hero's brother that was the pilot... That would have been interesting. You know, okay. Which could have been interesting And then he goes have... into this, like, teleported world or whatever and then comes back and he's, like, evil and that's why he's... Or evil, even you know so, I mean? you have... Takashi is Callahan's, like, favorite student, right? And Takashi's obviously Hiro's brother. You could have both Hiro and Callahan taking two very different ways to deal with loss. They start down the same path, but Hiro ends up, you know trying to like do it the right way while callahan goes too far maybe sees takashi as a surrogate son there you go and like goes to like murder rampage like and sees hero like hero don't you want to kill Cray too he took takashi away from us like he was my you know almost i consider him my son you, he was your brother like we should make him pay and then hero is the one that has to say like no this is the wrong way and then you create by doing that a protagonist and an antagonist that actually want the exact same thing the exact same thing which is so strong Right. They want to get Takashi back because he's been sent into this teleported world or whatever. Hiro finds out that he's actually not dead and that Mm -hmm. there's like, or he could be alive or something. And then who does he save at the end? Sacrificing Baymax? His brother. Yeah. That would be amazing. How much stronger is that? Yeah. Who cares about Callahan's daughter? If maybe Tadashi was like married to her, or it's his right. girlfriend or something, something. then and then like the oh, they were that friends. Been better, they were it? friends with like the Callahans or something like that, and so like it was like a family kind of thing. And before we dive into a complete punch up here, <laughs> I yeah, wanted to we're, ta- we're right there. Yeah, we're the right cusp. on the cusp. I want to talk a little bit about superheroes, yes. and how that comes into play in this film, and why it doesn't really make much sense. Right, that's the the other main thing that's that's sandwiched in the middle of this movie is hero getting all of. Tadashi's friends who have now become his friends together to form an 
Avengers like superhero team based off of using their inventions and his uh, you know incredible brain he can come up with all these designs for um, weapons and costumes and all this kind of stuff and it seems to come out of compl- like nowhere nowhere it's one thing it's if- a scene where literally by the way I just thought about this the scene that's really weird is they're sitting in that mansion it happens in one scene and here's just like oh we gotta like uh, you know I'm gonna just upgrade Baymax's scanner and he can find the guy is but and he looks at everybody and he sees the superhero pictures and it's almost like very selfish which again the movie doesn't come back to to make this a message he selfishly involves all his friends to risk their lives to go kill a villain or get answers to help with his you know finding out what really happened to Tadashi and he's just like we're all gonna be superheroes and like in one scene they're like yeah and then (laughs) cue up fallout boy hit music and we have them all training with a butler like cutting stuff with lightsabers like lighting things on fire a a training montage we never knew we needed right and we were like it it was almost at that point in the movie i was like wait wait what's it wait no no no. what's happening wait Uh this was a different film why right because i forgot for a moment when i started watching this film i forgot the posters and the trailer i was like oh no that's right they form a superhero team what wait why are they forming a superhero team and then at the end of the movie there's still a superhero team to fight what from from what i've seen San Francisco is a beautifully wonderful town. It's a really nice place to no, live. Nothing ever seems to be wrong. The cops, even though they don't seem to believe you when you say a man. You know why? You know what? That makes that scene make even more sense when the cop is looking at him and he says, a man in a kabuki mask tried to kill me and my robot. And the cop's like, I don't believe that. And he doesn't believe that because San Francisco seems like the most peaceful place ever. The only illegal thing that anyone's doing in this place is, is, bot having, fighting. is having battle bot fights. But in San Francisco, there is no criminal element. No. so It's just so, the guy in the kabuki mask. So you're right. It makes sense that the cop is just like, yeah, right, whatever. Because everything's perfect and the whole city's beautiful and there's no like scary areas i mean kids can just build robots in their garage and go to nerd schools and freaking live in mansions and the one bad guy that shows up as a result of something that is not really that important to anyone that we care about but is important to him so like okay that's fine who becomes evil to a weird degree yeah gets arrested and then there's this montage dialogue thing at the end where it's just like, we'll continue to save the city against dot, Something. dot, dot. <laughs> Like, I don't... I yeah, just there's was like, like a the news end thing. Of the movie, I was like, what the they hell? They have like a news feed. They're like, and people left the scene and nobody saw their faces, these mysterious heroes. And it's like, one, none of them are wearing masks. Like, I'm sure somebody <laughs> figured that out. And was like, oh yeah, I know yeah, who that is. It must be those nerd school kids. From the nerd school kids with the tech. And stuff. <sighs> okay. So it looks like as a recap, our biggest dislikes are the hero's arc, or hero's arc, I guess, and the villain, as well as just the concept of these characters being superheroes at all in this film. So we went into a little bit of our punch-up already, um, which I liked for the villain, which was kind of a tweak of making, you know, maybe the character that quote-unquote died or got lost in this Stargate, if you're going to keep this whole Stargate thing again anyways, is going to be Tadashi, right? having him be the character that goes away, because now you have both the hero and the villain on the same path when we start, right? We have them both going after who they think is Cray or Clay for revenge, right? We have the friends and Baymax and them trying to help Hero to realize, you know, how to better deal with loss, while Callahan doesn't have that. Callahan sees Tadashi as this surrogate son and just does everything he possibly can to get back at Clay or Cray, whatever his name is, and goes the wrong way about it, and it takes Hero and his friends to help Hero realize, you know, this is the right way to do things, and this is how we can maybe save Tadashi's memory going forward. This is what we can do that's right. You're ruining Tadashi's memory maybe by turning Baymax max into this like murder robot just because you're angry exactly doesn't mean that you need to you know turn this thing that's supposed to be innocent into a killing machine or turn us into killing machines or or other superheroes just to satisfy your revenge cravings right and give hero the the superhero obsession if you're gonna have this superhero bit in the film like it's fred who's a very funny character in the movie who's played by tj miller does the voice he, it's very very funny but like it's like fred just being like well, let's be superheroes and the lines are funny but like it should be hero it's hero story he should be the one who maybe early on has a fascination with superheroes yeah put him put him all in his room there's like he's he's obsessed with 
the Avengers. He's obsessed with superior teams because why he uh, he never felt you know give it some give it some reasoning right? right. He never felt like his brother appreciated him. He he always wanted like a brother who was like gonna play with him, but his brother's too old because he's like you know, right. and so he always wanted like friends. He has none because he's too smart. And here he meets all these other people and they accept him. Yeah, these these uh, nerd school friends of Tadashi's they accept Hiro. He's shy at first, but then after uh, Tadashi's death, they become his friends, and he it's like the superhero team that he never had. But then he goes too far, and it's he almost makes like them actual superheroes. And what's interesting is the movie almost has Baymax indulge him in his fantasy. Right? Baymax is like, "If this, will this help you? Yes, it'll help me. Will this help it's you? Like yes, it will help you." And it's like it's exactly it's like a drug. It's a really great way to have a conversation about people can dip into these fantasy worlds to not deal with the reality to not deal with the loss and that's a really great conversation to have especially in a sea of other superhero movies yes to have this conversation of like yes you know superheroes can have important lessons but like this is a fantasy yeah. like you're taking these are friends who really could talk to you about tadashi could right. talk about the things they remember about tadashi the things you remember about tadashi the things that should live on but instead, you're pushing that to the side to just push forward with this revenge fantasy that we're all going to just meet this Cray guy and beat him and take him to the cops. Or maybe who knows how far you're going at this point. Baymax doesn't even look like what he used to. And, and you know, Baymax, you know, keeps having this thing with like a scanner, like he scans people to figure out what's wrong with them. Maybe what I was thinking, which is he, really amazing, it's which a, is really it's amazing, a great part of the movie, which I think. If you're going along this line where Hero goes a little bit too far and kind of corrupts Baymax, you could have that he even takes that out to add in, like, laser eyes or something like that. Which which could happen is at the end of the film, he brings Baymax back to his original self, and Baymax can scan and sees Tadashi's in the Stargate or whatever, and they go in and they get him, right? So Baymax being in tip-top normal shape is what helps them come back to find right. Tadashi, right? Right. One thing you could do. Yeah, and, and it's the abuse of these of this power of intelligence, because they create these amazing inventions, and Hero then reappropriates them into these sort of like nefarious purposes. They're weapons, is what they are. In order to do something seemingly noble, mm -hmm. right? But it's revenge. And when it comes, and, and there's collateral damage, and when it comes down to it, it's like, it wasn't anyone's fault. Now, if you want to make it someone's fault, like Cray started the fire, or you know, whatever, then like, you know, that's which makes that deal. even more difficult at the end when hero does realize that his vengeance is justified, that Cray did cause this or Cray did lead to Tadashi getting sucked into a Stargate on purpose. Right. That can make even him choosing not to go down a darker path, even more powerful when right. he says, you know, this isn't the way we do things. And they stop Callahan or they stop whoever. And hopefully, you know, bring Tadashi back. Don't bring Tadashi back. However you do that ending. But that makes it a lot more powerful. Right. I spoke before about there being two different arcs. Mm -hmm. An arc that is completed but doesn't match, you know? Right. So there's this beginning arc where sort of what we're talking about. Like, there's loss and Hero, you know, like, starts reappropriating this these machines and these people and all this kind of stuff. And then this is the ending that we're talking about, right? Right. This is the ending of that arc. And I think that's the strongest one. Oh, yeah. Now, the ending of the movie and then finding a beginning to that, to that arc could be, you know, where you have these kids and they have all these inventions and they become a superhero team and all that kind of stuff. Now, a different way you can go with this is these are kids who have always been made fun of, have never had friends, and they're all, like, they graduated early from their high schools. They're all, like, really young. They're in, like, this co collegiate program. And they're, like, they, they don't fit in with the older kids that are going to college. They don't fit in with their peers. And no one ever takes them seriously, especially their inventions. So when they're in the face of a nefarious plot, they realize, you know, maybe we can do something about it. And then they band together and become, like, a superhero team and take their, their inventions, which are amazing but are kind of useless and maybe have no application, and create sort of innocuous weapons out of them, but then when used together can create a shitstorm for a, a bad guy to try and get through. That's the beginning of the movie that ended. Right. And that was that's my problem. Is that, like, that's a great ending for that movie where there's, like... There's a this underworld that they never knew about that maybe the beginning with the battle bots is sort of, you know, connected to where they're trying the way, to like try out new uh technologies like underground and try to find things. And there should be like some more negative things around this underworld. It should be like exactly. there should be some problems with San Francisco other than just this one bad guy. If this is the way that you want to do this movie, so that when they find out they live in this idyllic like world where they're just like, Oh, everything's great and we're going to school and we're young and you know, whatever and everything's provided for us, whatever. We're smart as shit. 
But we have all these, like, whoever is the bad guy, be it Cray or Callahan or maybe even a, a, a bizarro version of the brother that comes back from a, the teleported world and is kind of evil for some reason or right. whatever. When they defeat these villains or the villain that is the person, we also know that there's more. So there's, like, that's one movie. The other movie is, is the, the, superhero the, per- movie. the personal story about loss and um, and and what I think is, is a really great read and something that that could have been really amazing is the selfishness of exploiting genius to create weapons for revenge purposes. Right. It's really what, that's what happens. Hero appropriates his friends' inventions, things that they love and care about to turn them into weapons. Including the invention of his brother. His brother. He basically destroys the remnants of what his brother left behind and it ends with him still being a a punching robot. Well, exactly, because that's the ending, is not doing that last part. He turns his brother's invention and destroys every bit of what his brother wanted to do Mm -hmm. and wanted it to be. And then in doing so, he basically destroys and tarnishes the memory of his brother, which at a critical moment at the end when he's about to, like, kill people and, and, you know, every he realizes this. He's putting all his friends in danger and all this kind of stuff. He realizes this, reverses it takes the the, the, the chips out, the armor and all that kind of stuff. And then that's when Baymax, the real true Baymax, comes into play where he actually fixes all the things and it's and it's his brother being revived. It's his brother's dream being revived. And it's him realizing that this robot who is made to help people against people like me, right. I became the villain. Yeah, and that's such a more interesting story. And and now... And they got really close to it. They had a scene where Baymax went, like, murderous. Berserk. And all of them were freaked out. And they, you know, they came really close. And then they were like, and back to being superheroes. So, and then the ending of that is, you know, cut to, like, everyone's saved. Maybe you have a, a, a nice little fin- after this moment where, you know, there's still a problem because he's created all this mess. And then, you know, uh, he uses Baymax and they use all their inventions in the way that they're originally intended. And they, like, save the day. They get Hero's brother or the girl or whoever back from the whatever world that's teleported. Who cares? Yeah. The Stargate world, right? And, uh, and then they save the day and, you know, he feels real bad about it and then the ending is instead of you know da, 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 we're superheroes the ending is they're rebuilding the school with the help of their inventions he has uh manufactured he's like in the process of creating um, more baymax creating more baymaxes and there's like a scene where you see a bunch of baymaxes like dropping like all around the world so that they can like you know help the the world's population with feeding the hungry and curing the sick and and all this kind of stuff you know how you ended with exactly that you have a scene where, just like you described, you have their, you know, all of their inventions doing different applications in, like, uh, you know, a town or a village somewhere that really needs it, like, with water resources or food, and you see Baymax is being distributed out, and you see, like, you know, shadows of, like, what could be these kids that we followed in this movie handing out these different things to everybody, and then you see, like, this helicopter starts spinning up, and you see all six of them go in and hop in the helicopter, and somebody runs up and says, like, who, who are you? Like, you did all this for us, like, please tell us who you are and a hand reaches out and passes them a card and the helicopter flies off and they look down at the card and it says Tadashi's Big Hero 6 and then you just cut to black from there. Yeah. So it's it's a superhero team but not a superhero team that goes around and punches things with laser swords. It's a superhero team that forging through their ideal technology that they set out to create, they bring heroism in a different way. To, in, a, in a humanitarian In a humanitarian sense. way throughout the entire world. And isn't that what superheroes are supposed to do? Exactly. The, and this is what a, what a novel, it seems like a novel idea, humanitarian superheroes. This is a superhero team that goes in and maybe after the disaster that Superman and the big alien caused, <laughs> they're the ones that come in afterwards and say, hey, I know your town got like completely destroyed from this crazy <laughs> alien attack, but our Baymaxes are here, our super laser cleanup crew is here, and we're big heroes six and we'll be back to help you guys and make sure you're fine and now we have a conversation about dealing with loss about reappropriation of technologies and funds and all of these things which is important i i love it all right guys well that was our punch up for big hero six and that'll take us right into our smash up smash 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 smash
And you're telling me that's from her new album? She just is the most incredible in the world. I mean, it's so inventive. What music style is that? Uh, hymn, hymnals. Hymnals? Yeah, wow. new new hymnals. And you and Celine Dion came up with hymnals. Absolutely. Listen, Celine Dion is a perennial figure. She was around since the dawn of time, some people have oh said. Oh my god, she is an immortal. I forgot about that. And you know, the thing is really good. Should we... We maybe maybe we should talk about this afterwards. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of secret the society and every, yeah, we'll talk about of that. Of course. Time. Yeah. Anyways, guys. So what you're here to hear about is the blockbuster smash up. Smash. And how our smash up game typically works is Todd and I come here, each one of us preparing a globally accepted good film and a globally accepted bad film. Todd for today has the globally accepted bad film. I have the extraordinary pleasure of the. <laughs> globally accepted bad film and providing you with a stinker oh god and i have the globally accepted good film and on the count of three todd and i will both say our films at the same time thus slamming them together canonically for all time so guys (laughs) on the count of three one one, two two, three three, 13th warrior tingle oh wait i don't think i actually saw the movie but i heard about it (laughs) do you know Oh, man. Okay. Do you remember teaching Mrs. Tingle? I, I swear I've heard that name, and it's not like in a good thing. It's not like a good phrase where someone's like, you saw teaching Mrs. Tingle, of course, right? It's like, of course I saw teaching Mrs. Tingle. I saw it 15 times. Can we just say f- teaching Mrs. Tingle actually teaching Mrs. Tingle. 15 times? Because <laughs> then we'll summon the teacher The here, movie right? itself, I, I, like, I barely remember it because it's so forgettable. So, Todd, uh, what is teaching Mrs. Tingle about? <laughs> well, teaching Mrs. Tingle is... That's teaching um, Mrs. Tingle, that's right? That's exactly. The, the, the movie is about teaching Mrs. Tingle. Oh, okay, that movie. And um, basically, Helen Mirren <laughs> plays Mrs. Tingle. Surprisingly. And she's a uh, she's a, a, a teacher who's like a stone-cold bitch. Um, uh, Katie Holmes is, you know, supposed to be the star student who is get who gets caught cheating, except she wasn't, oh, and, no. uh, by Mrs. Tingle. And um, they go to her, she goes to her house to try and plead to her better nature and uh, with her like boyfriend who stole the test uh, answers and all this kind of stuff, things go wrong. A crossbow and what? what? Yeah, there's a crossbow. There's a crossbow in there. <laughs> and, what, did she? Did they bring the crossbow? I, I think it was in her house. I really don't know. And <laughs> okay. basically, she gets knocked out. Mrs. Tingle does. And basically, like they get stuck at the house and they don't know what to do. The teacher's knocked out, and you know they don't know whether to go to police or whatever. And the, the rest of the movie takes place in Mrs. Tingle's house, where they are. Uh, it's like sort of a cat and mouse. Game game she gets loose and you know i mean it sounds like you had the best globally accepted film right <laughs> <laughs> this is um this is what happens when you're teaching mrs tingle yeah I, that's what i imagine yeah when you're teaching who mrs tingle oh is that the the teacher yeah with, oh. the, with the tingler oh okay that makes sense <laughs> so my film i chose the globally accepted good film was 13th warrior now Thir- Todd, i haven't seen it it's an awesome film with tonio banderas he plays what? yeah he plays a uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Really? Antonio Banderas is in this Yeah, Antonio Banderas is in this film. He plays an ambassador from Saudi Arabia. What? We'll skip by that. (laughs) He goes to the north to be an ambassador with Vikings. This is the good film. This is the good film. Okay. This is the good one. All right. Um, And he goes to meet with Vikings. There's apparently a big man-bear problem up in the north. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, I know. I'm moving real real fast. Uh... (laughs) He meets up with these Vikings. He's he's the reason why it's called the Thirteenth Warrior is there's a big problem up in Man Bear Country, and they need thirteen <laughs> warriors to go help. Antonio Banderas was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they were like, "You help!" And he was like, "What?" And now he's on a is ship. Is he the Thirteenth Warrior? He's the Thirteenth Warrior, I see what and he's brought up there. there, and he he meets all his Viking buddies, and they build a bond of friendship while they slay and kill Man Bear men up in Viking Country. It's really a family movie. But um, <laughs> <laughs> these Man Bear men, I'm I'm I I'm tempted to ask. They're like uh, they're like an indigenous like mythological race that this like desolated village is like whispering of they're like the, the men in the in the mountains like they come down in the mist and they come and attack us and like oh, we so need like, warriors to protect so like adrian brody and william hurt and, yeah yeah, yeah. Ellen from the Burst village from the village yeah uh, that's what they do in the in their spare time they right. uh when they're not scaring that village they go over to the neighboring village and they come down as man bear men and they and they scare antonio banderas and a bunch of vikings yeah, that makes sense i mean they got free time right you know when the, that costumes are expensive you got to use them as much as possible yeah so, absolutely yeah. and uh you know they have a lot of violence, and uh, it's a great movie. <laughs> Is it? It's really a good movie. It's a really good movie. I recommend, guys, please go check out 13th Warrior, wherever you can find it. So yeah, 13th Warrior is awesome, so now we have to uh, yeah, we smash have, we're charged these, with the task uh, of uh, smash smashing the 13th Warrior into the teaching, into of, the teaching of the tingle. Yeah. How are we going to tingle this one? <laughs> 
how are, we, how are they going to tingle their way out of this one? <laughs> this is how I think this works out. So these kids go over to teach Mrs. Tingle a lesson, right? Yeah. She's this, you know, she's this really angry lady. Like they don't they know go why. Over, they go over to the, the... They go over to her house. The neighboring village? No, no, no. They go to her house. <laughs> okay. And they find, like, in her front yard, they find, like, a crossbow, and they find some stuff, and they're like, what's going on? And, like, they see her, like, kind of battening down the hatches inside her house, and they bust in, and they're like, ah, oh, we're gonna get you! And, like, they, you know, they tie her up, and she's like, we've gotta get safety, we gotta get shelter! And they're like, what? And in busts in Antonio Banderas, and he's like, oh my god, you know, like, maybe this is, like, his wife or whatever. Helen Mirren could have been, maybe at that time, no. Yeah, sure. Sure, baybe. Yeah, he likes been, uh, you know, older, older, older women. But, you know, he busts in, and he's like, oh, like, what are you kids doing? Like, we need to protect the house. Like, it's about to be attacked by bear men. And they're like, Mrs. Tingle, we have no idea. He's, she's like, did you bring the tingler? And he's like, no, <laughs> actually, I did. I did bring the tingler. It's That's like, the only weapon, it's the only, oh, no, they didn't bring it. They didn't bring the tingler. They did not bring the tingler. Yeah. They left it at school mm-hmm. where they must get, fight to get to. To get to the school, and they have to defend out the school against the attack of this onslaught of bear men. Yeah. See, Mrs. Tingle was just on edge because she knew she was going to have to fight bear men in, like, you know, a week. That's the whole reason she was on edge this whole time. Exactly. In you her know, career. they just they just didn't know that it was a very normal thing that she was going to fight bear men. Her her husband has been gone for a very long time out scouting for bear men. Then at the end of the movie is when they get to the school, they get the tingler. Mm-hmm. They have to fight through just hordes of bear men. Hordes of bear men. I mean, this is like this is like very violent. What would it be called? Would so it, be- it would be called. Uh, Te- oh no, the thirteenth Tingle Warrior. Teaching the thirteenth Tingle Warrior. That's, That's it. amazing. You have been chosen to be the Tingle Warrior. <laughs> the the one who protects the the one who uses the Tingler. The one who will save us all. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> this concludes episode fifteen of Blockbuster Punch Up and our review of Big Hero Six. We'll be posting a new episode every other week. Please leave us a review or any comments on iTunes. It helps people find this glorious Celine Dion show and tribute that we have. Tingle on. If you'd like to download more episodes or check out other similar podcasts, head over to partialarc.com. That's arc with the C. Of course, you can email us any questions and your love of Celine Dion at blockbusterpunchup at gmail.com. And let us know your punch-ups, of course, for Big Hero 6. We'd love to hear those. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at partialarc. And you can follow Todd on Twitter and Instagram at TG11. My tingle will go on. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and see you on the next episode of Blockbuster Punch-Up! Let's go home.